All right. Welcome, everyone, to Rain Gardens 101. Get your lawn a job. My name is Matthew Bertrand. I'm with Friends of the Rouge. I'm a senior restoration coordinator. I'm thrilled to have you here today. Enormous thanks to the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation for making today's event possible. Uh, before I get going, I have been told that people in this universe only have a three minute attention span these days. We will see whether that's true or not, but I'm gonna give you the three minute kickoff here. And then I'll let all of you that have just that attention span, you can get going. For the rest of you, you can stick around me a little bit longer. So uh, what is a rain garden? This is Rain Gardens 101. I have had so many people come up to me and say, Matthew, I have a rain garden. I have this beautiful garden and rain falls on it. It's a rain garden. Well. There's some truth in that. It's true that sure enough, a garden that gets rained on, that, that rain garden has that happen too. But a rain garden is a little bit more than that. In addition to the rain that falls directly on the garden, a rain garden is also getting water that is running off of typically a roof for a home residence, but it can also be from another hard surface like a parking lot or a road or a sidewalk or what have you. And so what that rain garden does though, is it solves a lot of problems at the same time. So first off, it's getting that water away from your foundation securely. So we're keeping water out of the basement. We're getting water off of sidewalks so we don't have icing as much in the winter time. We're also holding that water back. This garden is going to fill up after a storm. It's going to soak in in 24 to 48 hours. We're keeping that water out of the street. So we're fighting street flooding. We're keeping it out of our sewer systems, um, which is how water gets um, back and up into basements. And we're keeping it out of our rivers where there's flooding and there's water pollution. So rain gardens are a great way for us to get that water on a job to solve all kinds of problems simultaneously. Last but not least, uh, rain gardens are typically planted with native plants that are supporting pollinators, supporting birds, supporting butterflies. So that rain garden is also bringing beauty, dynamic living beauty to our yard. Um, sample rain garden for you. This is Anne's residence in Plymouth Township. Worked with her a couple years ago. She had a yard that was so wet that she could not mow some of the grass until June every year. Uh, and she wanted to use a rain garden to solve that. So she took the master rain gardener class and she designed for right in that little island right in front of her house. And here is Anne showing off her hard work afterwards through the master rain gardener class. She designed her own rain garden and then we worked with her to get that thing built. It now keeps her lawn dry. She gets beautiful flowers every year that uh, add quality to her life, that attract wildlife, um, that make her yard and her community a better place to be. So uh, Anne is a great example of what we're trying to do here. What's a rain garden? It is a fun project for the whole family. It is something that you too can can do and you can have a lot of fun doing it. Uh, and Ring Garden is also another tool in the toolbox. So folks that are having drainage issues, oftentimes they're gonna get told they need to do a dry well or a French drain. And those are our traditional solutions, especially if you're on clay soils, which is the truth for about half the people that live in the Rouge that live here in Southeast Michigan. A dry well just does not work that well. A rain garden is an excellent solution. It is our gold standard for solving drainage issues in a home landscape. That dry well on clay, it's gonna soak up maybe 20 to 50 gallons. It's gonna cost over $2,000 and it's just not gonna work very well on clay. It's gonna fill up and it's gonna stay full of water for a week. Uh, whereas in contrast, 120 square foot rain garden, it's going to soak up 340 up to 1,000 gallons of water, depending on the soils. It's going to cost about the same up to a little more, depending on your design preferences, and it will drain in less than 48 hours, even on heavy clay soils. So rain gardens are one of our key solutions out there for drainage issues. Before I get any farther, I've got some teasers for you uh, as a part of, you know, adding some fun to our, our presentation today. Um, you at the end are going to be able to enter into drawing for door prizes. So we've got a 50 gallon red rain barrel available today and also a consultation, uh, an hour virtual consultation discussing uh, solutions at your home. So exciting things to look forward to. It's going to be at the very end. So three minute folks, you know, you either have to stick around for longer than three minutes or you have to know how to fast forward one of those two. So uh, other thing I want to make sure those three minute folks know is that we have funding available coming up for rain gardens about $23,000 maybe more and that's going to be for at least 12 residential rain gardens priority communities include Detroit, Dearborn, South End especially, Redford and Highland Park. 
not in those communities still apply. Uh, we might not get enough applicants from those priority communities. And also every year we're working on additional funding. And so we'd rather know you're interested than not know you're interested. This application is gonna be live in about a week or two. We could not get it done by today, unfortunately. And if you are signed up for this presentation through Zoom, then you will get an email announcement. We will be sharing this widely. So something to look forward to. And uh, we're recommending that folks apply by October 30th. Uh, to maximize their consideration. But again, we are gonna be taking these applications on a rolling basis there afterwards. All right, three minute folks, uh, you are released. Everyone else, our agenda for today, Rain Gardens 101, we're gonna talk about what, what is a rain garden? We're gonna talk about why, why would you do a rain garden? We're gonna talk about rain smart. Those are resources to help you be successful with a rain garden. Today's presentation is really just the kickoff for you. It's the roadmap. Um, rain smart is gonna show you how to get there. And then we're gonna round it out with a discussion of where to help you get an idea for where at your home might be appropriate. We're gonna step you through a series of uh, quiz questions where you get to guess whether or not it's a good place for a rain garden. And then at the end, we will get to how, sizing, digging, planting. It's a lot in a short amount of time, but uh, stay with me. We're gonna have a lot of fun as we move through all this. But before we get into that, I want to just introduce Friends of the Rouge. Uh, Friends of the Rouge is a nonprofit organization based here in Southeast Michigan. The map on the left with the little white line, that is the watershed for the Rouge River. Those are the lands that drain to the river. And what you can see from this map, it's showing land cover across the state of Michigan. The red areas on there are urbanized areas. Those are our densely populated communities across the state. And you can see that the Rouge is pretty much the most urbanized watershed in the entire state of Michigan, if not the entire United States. Um, and we know this, please feel free to type into the chat if you'd like your experiences with the Rouge, your perceptions of the Rouge, and those can be the positive or the negative. I like to be forward about the fact that the Rouge has had challenges, right? Um, the Rouge is a river that has given back to all of us here in Southeast Michigan. Uh, indeed, it is given to the world. It is the river on which the automobile was born. It is the river that helped get the world through World War I and World War II by supporting the arsenal of democracy, building the planes, the tanks, the vehicles that helped um, carry us through that conflict. Uh, it is a river that caught fire in 1969. It was one of the urbanized rivers, the four in the Midwest that caught fire. And that caught the attention of John Dingle, uh, who was instrumental in passing the Clean Water Act, which has in turn cleaned up lakes, rivers, and streams across the United States. So the Rouge was a key part to play in that. And uh, that gave back to the country. It also gave back to the Rouge. The Rouge has come a long ways. The picture on the top right there, that's a picture from one of our industrial kayak trips. That is the Rouge plant right there in the background. If you have not done it yet, please take this as your invitation to join us out on the river. One of the things we're most excited about at Friends of the Rouge right now is that we are working on a 27 mile water trail that extends from Canton all the way down through Dearborn out past um, uh, Melvindale to the Detroit River. 27 miles. We believe at Friends of the Rouge that you should not have to drive four hours for Pure Michigan. You should have it right here in your own backyard in Southeast Michigan, and we are working to make that happen. I invite you to be a part of that solution. And being here today is critical. Uh, a lot of our restoration these days, it focuses on rain gardens. Your being here today is critical to the effort. So thank you for being here. If you want to do more, I invite you to become a member of Friends of the Rouge. We are a membership organization. And uh, if you want to learn more, you can visit the rouge.org uh, to learn more about all of these things, the rouge.org. And I'll give you more URLs as we get going. All right. So into the what of a rain garden, I'm going to give you one more sample rain garden here. This is a rain garden I designed and built at the Plymouth Municipal Yard just down the way from our office at Park in Plymouth. This is the before. I worked with Adam Gerlach over there. And uh, they they felt like their front entryway could be a little more attractive. That was one of the things that, that started the conversation. The other thing is that they've got this massive roof. You can't see the whole thing, but it is like 6,000 square feet uh, that drains right out front here. And it would ice up every winter time. It would be hazardous and it is un unsightly. And so we decided to try to use a rain garden to solve a couple problems at the same time. So here's a picture of the garden right after we built it. You can see there that there's a new um, concrete sidewalk that uh, takes you right into the entryway. 
You've got um, sunken depression area that fills up with water. The water now goes under the sidewalk. And uh, this rain garden soaks up, I think it's about 7,000 gallons of water every time it's, uh, it rains. So it's an enormous contribution to help Tonquish Creek, which is one of the least healthy tributaries of the Rouge system. And uh, here is what the garden was looking like back in 2019. So you can see some of the native plants starting to come into their full. There's orange butterfly and weed there blooming right now, a great pollinator plant, a great milkweed plant. So beautiful rain garden, beautiful example of how we can use rain gardens to make our existing uh, community spaces, to make our homes better places to be. All right, so in the what's, I like to do a lot of just basic overview. So a lot of people ask me, all right, but what are these things gonna look like exactly? And I kind of broken it down into three major types of rain gardens. And the reality is most people that have heard of a rain garden, think about the one on the right, that habitat focused rain garden, that wild, messy, crazy native plant space that is incredibly valuable for pollinators. But, you know, a lot of people wonder, is that really, is that right for my home? Is that going to be something my neighbors are going to accept? Is that going to be something I'm going to accept? Uh, you know, is that right? And so then people tend to discount rain gardens. But I'm here to tell you that there's a lot of ways that rain gardens can look. They are gardens. Fundamentally, gardens can look like many things and they can be customized to your taste. So on the left, you can see an example of a ground cover texture style rain garden. That is a 100% native plant garden. It's got brown fox sedge on the bottom for that ground cover texture. And it's got red maple growing happily in this you know, highly polluted salt filled uh, roadside rain garden in the Ann Arbor area along Miller Avenue. And then in the middle, there's an example of a garden, a manicured rain garden that fits well into a highly designed landscape space. Um, typically, I recommend folks, um, you know, put the money uh, for a manicured garden, put that into your front yard, you know, show off to your friends and neighbors how beautiful these can be, but also consider having a habitat focused uh, rain garden as well. Uh, the backyard is a great place for that in your private sanctuary, you can then see and enjoy all those butterflies that are coming to visit you. But the reality is you get to do whatever you want. The picture on the right is actually a front yard in Ann Arbor where you can do those kinds of things and the picture in the middle is a backyard space. So, uh, so that's my overview um, about what rain gardens can look like. What do rain gardens cost? Um, the costs vary widely. If you're going to do it yourself, expect maybe two to three dollars a square foot. If you just hire somebody to dig it for you, maybe five to ten dollars a square foot. If you hire out the entire thing, maybe fifteen to thirty dollars a square foot. Prices vary widely, and a lot of that is your aesthetics, how much you want to invest in the garden itself. Uh, I stepped through here some examples of what it might cost. If you're DIYing it, you know, free design, free excavation, you might pay 200 bucks for plants for a small rain garden, or if you know gardeners, um, you can dig them up for free. There's all kinds of plant swaps that happen. You can potentially get mulch delivered for free from tree trimming companies, but I will say that that kind of mulch does not work as well. It floats away. It is worth investing in buying a shredded hardwood mulch, which works great in rain gardens. And then oftentimes, Times, depending on your soils, you might want to buy some compost, but not everybody has to do that. And then you can see on the right there what that might look like for a professionally designed rain garden. So just a, a ballpark concept for you there, free up to $15 to $30 a square foot. All right, uh, next question I often get is, you know, you're digging up your rain garden, what do I do with all this dirt? Um, you know, a rain garden takes digging. We are going to be digging down three to six, maybe nine inches or so, and that might produce like typically about five cubic yards, five tons of soil that we have to do something with. And for many folks, this is the biggest barrier to doing a rain garden is figuring that out. So I've got a couple examples here showing you what we do with that dirt. Uh, on the left, it's showing a berm on a rain garden space. That left side is a berm. The right side is showing a bermed landscape. So many people pay a lot of money actually to get soil like that delivered at their house so that they can build an elevated landscape space. So if you know you're gonna be doing a rain garden and if your uh, lawn is something of an open palette, then you can think about doing a built up raised garden somewhere else on your landscape. And that makes your yard all the more attractive. That change in topography is really gorgeous. feels great. You can create beautiful spaces. Um, my... Let's see if it moves forward. There we go. All right, it's having, it's having some problems there with some of its uh, pictures. The, the garden that's half covered there is St. Suzanne's in Detroit. And that is a garden that used all of its soil on the berm for the rain garden. So it's very easy to do that uh, when you're building a rain garden. I'll fix that in the future. Uh, here's another example. You can also pay to have that soil hauled off. This is a trailer that holds five cubic yards of soil. So about perfect for a typical rain garden. And uh, that thing costs about 75 bucks to get it dropped off, uh, $75 a day 
and then $5 a cubic yard. So for this rain garden that we dug in Plymouth Township, it cost about 125 bucks to get that soil hauled off. So a couple examples of what to do with that dirt again, some of the biggest barriers for folks as they're thinking about a rain garden. All right, now I'm gonna step you through one person's experience with a rain garden from start to finish. I want you all, now you know about some of the barriers, some of the solutions. I want you all to think about putting yourself in Denise's position here. This is Denise held in Ar Ann Arbor, putting yourself in her position, um, seeing how it is that she stepped through the process of designing and building a rain garden at her home. Put yourself in her shoes. You can start to see how you can make this a reality for yourself. Um, so this is Denise held. This is her story of a rain garden. It started with doing a soil infiltration test. And this is something that you all should do at your homes. Um, there's a lot of different ways to do it on the internet and uh, in our Master Rain Gardener training manual, which is available on our website, we'll share the URL for that in a bit. You'll see how to do it. Basically dig an 18 inch hole, fill it up with water, let it drain, um, or after a day, if it doesn't drain, fill it back up to the top and then time it as it's going down. You wanna time it over at least a 24 hour period. It's good to let it drain. And that gives us an idea for how quickly the water is gonna drain in your rain garden. And what we often find is clay soils. And that's what Denise found. She had clay soils and the internet will tell you, you cannot do a rain garden on clay soils. Do not believe the internet. The internet is wrong, literally hundreds upon hundreds of gardens, rain gardens built on clay soils in Southeast Michigan. And in fact, a rain garden is the best solution for uh, drainage issues on clay soils. So even if you have clay, don't worry, you can make a beautiful rain garden that will work well. So Denise ended up taking the Master Rain Gardener training class. It's a five-part intensive course. This is the crash course today. The Master Rain Gardener class is gonna be the one where you do all the steps with expert support, five parts. This is her design that she produced as a part of the, the class. And she was ambitious. She made a two-tier design, an upper ponding area, and then an overflow into a lower ponding area and a berm on the bottom. And you can see all the plants that she picked for her rain garden on there. There is Denise uh, as she's pretty much finished up digging and shaping the garden. You can see that upper ponding area on the left and then the lower area on the right. And then here is Denise as she's laying out all of her plants, um, getting them ready to go in the ground. Denise is an avid gardener. The plants that are in those little white squares, those are ones she bought. Everything else she dug up from other gardens of hers or from friends and neighbors. Uh, so a way to get a really affordable rain garden. And then here is Denise, that picture you saw at the start, um, showing off um, the results of all of her hard work in the first year after she did it. And um, this is actually her second rain garden that she did. I'm kind of skipping past some things today. Um, here's what the rain garden looked like the following spring. You can she, see that she loves color in her spring garden. She's got irises blooming. She's got columbines, a cultivar of a columbine blooming in this garden. She's got wild geraniums blooming. She's got all kinds of color happening. It is a thriving space in the springtime. And then here's what the garden looked like late summer uh, at the end of her third year. And you'll see on here an example of how a rain garden, like any garden, it is something that changes over time. She decided she did not like that berm. She wanted to have more bricks as a facer. So you can see how she adjusted her garden over time. And then you can see some of her beautiful high summer blooms here. She has got echinacea, the native coneflower blooming. She's got daylilies blooming. She's got prairie dock, which is that great lime green big leaf in the middle that sends up eight foot intimidating flower stalks. So beautiful, beautiful plants in her rain garden. So that was Denise's experience going from start to finish, getting a rain garden at her home in the Ann Arbor area. And you can do it too. All right, so that is the what. And um, I forgot to mention at the start, uh, please feel free to use the Q&A feature, add some qu uh, questions in there. I'm gonna take a quick look now in the pause here and see if there are any that are um, really relevant to the what here. And uh, some questions that I will answer later on, I will leave. Um, Jacob is asking about where we rented that trailer. We rented that from Bushel Mart. We're actually working right now on a resource calling around landscape contractors or landscape supply companies to find out about those resources. We're gonna to try to have a list of all the companies that you can work with to get soil um, pulled off from your yard. So, uh, so stay tuned on that, Jacob. Uh, let's see, what else? Um, Dana asks, can you put a rain garden over where they have multiple feet of rock in the yard to try to help with the standing water problem? Um, it's, if there's a lot of rocks present, it might be a little difficult to dig. Um, you might need to move some of those rocks to make it a little bit easier to dig um, because you're gonna wanna make that shallow. It's typically about three to six inches depth. 
um, space for the water to soak in. You could have rocks on the bottom of your rain garden instead of plants or instead of um, the shredded hardwood mulch. That's another aesthetic for a rain garden. I typically recommend against rocks though, just because they tend to be really high maintenance. You can see every last weed that pops up in that rock space. And the reality is that plants do a whole lot to help the process of a rain garden working, especially on clay soil. So shredded hardwood mulch tends to work the best uh, in my experience. And then let's see, the other um, questions we will address later on. All right, I'm gonna move ahead now to the why. Why might you wanna do a rain garden? Well, I, the first is you might have water problems, right? Um, I saw at the start, many people sharing some of their water problems. Here's a home in the Ann Arbor area. It might just be my home maybe uh, that uh, I was surprised to find a pretty significant water issue. Uh, the first April after I moved in, but I thought, ha ha, water, you chose the wrong first time homeowner to mess with. And so I ended up making my plans for, uh, for rain gardens and uh, the pandemic um, gave me the time and space to do it, which I was grateful for. So here you can see uh, after I got done digging and planting rain gardens in the back area by my vegetable garden, by my daughter's um, sand playground area. And you can also see the start of some additional native plant gardens. I've got some cardboard that I layered down on the turf grass. I dug out a trench to define the lawn edge. So starting to kill the grass, and on the bottom right, you can see where I added in a, just a native plant landscape. It's not a rain garden, but I wanted to reduce my lawn area overall. And I also reduced some of the lawn area by the fence on the right. And then here is a picture um, the next year. This was from last year, and I'm working on getting a picture from this year um, as the garden is coming in. And I actually, this last year, ended up taking down the chain link fence on the right. And you can kind of see I removed about 400 square feet of asphalt and built a whole nother rain garden on the right. So a lot happening in there. And I am proud to report that that water problem is solved. It is no more much to the chagrin of my daughters who liked playing in that puddle immensely. So <laughs> unfortunately, but a rain garden is a great great, great way to solve some big problems at your home. Uh, rain gardens also solve problems with ice on the sidewalk, especially. Many people have their downspouts draining to the sidewalk. The sidewalks over time raise, sink, tree roots buckle them. They create low spots um, that where the water gets trapped. And a rain garden can be a great way to create a low spot that allows the water to exit that sidewalk such that you do not get that icing issue anymore, solving that safety hazard. We do not want to be this guy when we're walking down our street. We don't want our neighbors to be this guy either. And a rain garden is a great way to work towards solving that issue. Uh, another great reason to do a rain garden is you want to be a leader. The reality is that rain gardens are tested and true at this point. Uh, here in Southeast Michigan, there are at least, I think, about 1,300 or so rain gardens that have been built. And we have seen across those rain gardens, maybe two residential failures across that entire time. These things work. They're not hard to do. Many people have done them. Yet at the same time here in Southeast Michigan, we have over 3 million residents. So the reality is you are probably still gonna be the early adopter on your block. Uh, and so you have the opportunity to be a leader, to create something beautiful in your front yard space that's solving problems. And then you can show to your neighbors what the solution is. What we've seen in the research is that after two people on a block make this change and add a rain garden, it goes from being the like, what are you doing thing to the like, oh wait, this is a thing people are doing and maybe, maybe I can do it too. So you as the leader can help make this happen. There are so many ways to be a leader. This is Roger Moon um, showing off his rain garden back in 2012. And he puts it on garden walks every year so that gardeners in his community have a chance to see uh, an active rain garden and learn from him and his experiences with it. So being a leader is a great reason to build a rain garden. But really there are some big picture challenges that we're dealing with here that Friends of the Rouge is dealing with that communities across Southeast Michigan and indeed the world are dealing with. And and you can be part of that solution. So this picture, I think, encapsulates Southeast Michigan in a nutshell. Uh, feel free to type into the chat some of the problems that you see on this picture. We're just going to soak it up for a sec. And, and yes, all puns are unintended, but they will come out um, <laughs> throughout the chat. I can't help myself. Um, let's see if anyone has tossed in, no one's tossed any problems that they've seen yet. I'll start stepping through some of them. There's obviously the water in the street, which we see across Southeast Michigan. We're seeing increasingly intense rain events causing flooding. We see water in people's yards here. Many people are dealing with excessive water uh, in their lawns, in their garden beds, making it hard for them to live their lives. We're also seeing in the river here on the right, 
you can see just the amount of water flooding into that river. You can see eroded banks. You can see pollution in that river. The reality is that most of the pollution that goes to the Rouge River these days actually comes from our communities. It comes from um, our cars, especially. As we're driving about doing our business, our brakes have metals that wear off, our tires wear down, um, there's the oil dripping out of our cars. All of that concentrates in the river and is a major source of pollution. There's the fertilizers, the herbicides, the pesticides going on our lawn, uh, on our lawns, all that stuff. Um, you know, it might not be that big a deal where it falls, but it concentrates in the river. Rouge is about 460 square miles. And when you take 460 square miles of that junk and put it in one space, it makes it hard for anything to live in that river space. And then the water itself, we have so much water that runs off because of all these hard surfaces. It creates enormous erosion issues and flooding issues for the people that live downstream from us. There is a, a golden rule. You've probably heard the traditional golden rule, do unto those others as you'd have them do unto you. There's a golden rule of watersheds as well. That's do unto those downstream from you as you would have those upstream doing to you. So we're all a part of the solution. It's a connected system. People that are living in the suburbs, your water is running off into the Rouge and it's contributing towards flooding for people in Detroit. We all have a chance to be a part of the solution to do our part. And here's what that solution looks like. This is what we're aiming for. You can see massive change on this picture. I'm gonna do the before and the after there. And the first thing you're going to notice is all the tree cover, right? We lost so many of our trees to emerald ash borer and to Dutch elm disease. Huge, huge loss. And that's part of the problem. Uh, on this picture, there are also rain gardens built in many of the residences. Many of the parking lots now have trees planted in them, reduced parking area, converting parking spaces into green space, rain gardens to soak up water. You can also see, and this is what I love the most on this, is that this community has embraced the river. They've now got a river trail, sidewalk, um, bike space. They've got launches down here. This is just what we're doing with the Rouge right now. We are planning uh, a good half a dozen, dozen launches along the lower Rouge River um, as the river continues to improve in water quality. So this is a community that now embraces its river. It has got Pure Michigan right in its own backyard, and this is going to be where we are at. This is what we are working towards. You are a part of that solution. Now, that might seem like a lot and maybe more than you can handle. But you can be a really important part of that. I'm going to zoom in to one house and see right there. Here is the before and here's the after on that house. When we zoom into that one house, it is not that big a change. You can see the flooding issues in this lawn. And they planted one, two, three, maybe four trees, something like that. They've got a rain garden, maybe two rain gardens soaking up that water. It's not that big a change. But when we do it on a community scale, when we think and act like a community, it really adds up. And again, you're going to be the leader. You're probably still going to be the pioneer on your neighborhood. But after you do it, after another, another neighbor does it, it becomes the norm. We flip the script on what is accepted within our neighborhoods. So your efforts today are critical towards achieving this future. All right, so that is the why. I hope you see the value in taking the time and effort to figuring out a rain garden for your home. Now what we're going to do is I'm actually going to take a look at the Q&A and see if I've got any other questions that relate to that. Um, I'm gonna skim over those for now and save the ones I see for later. So now we're gonna talk about Rain Smart. This is basically your resources to help you be successful. Um, visit the rouge.org slash rain smart and there you will find just about everything that you need to be successful. And anything you need that is not there, let me know and I will get it on there. Um, that's uh, attempting to be our one-stop shop for you as you move forward. And I'm going to step through some of the resources that you're going to find on there right now. The first is the Master Rain Gardener class that I mentioned. This is what Denise took. Um, our next class that we're expecting to offer is going to be in February 2022. We've been doing it as a regional virtual class with about 90 other students, but you are going to get one-on-one -on -one attention. We had about 10 course instructors uh, in this uh, last winter time. It was a great experience. Um, so that's something I would recommend you look forward to. If you cannot wait, though, until then, um, then there is a free self-paced version of the class available right now at the rouge.org slash MRG. You can take that self-paced class watching recordings. You can join the Facebook group, which has, I think, about 2,000 people on it right now. You can post your pictures of your site. You can ask your questions. You can step through the class and get feedback all along the way, working towards your successful rain garden. So I highly recommend for anyone and everyone, this is the best way to dive deep 
and learn everything you need to be successful with building a rain garden. And then you can work towards adding your rain garden to the Master Rain Gardener Hall of Fame. Get your face on the map, get your rain garden on the map. You can be a part of the effort. And um, I am very excited. We are so close to launching a really cool, really cool program where you can add your pictures on there after you've completed your rain garden and become a resource for people across the region. So things to look forward to. Um, related to rain gardens, we have a rain barrel sale that's coming up this fall. It's gonna be held at Eastern Market in Detroit. There's a September 7th order deadline. And I have a whole nother class called Rain Barrels 101 if you wanna learn a little bit more about rain barrels and how they connect with rain gardens. So another resource to look forward to. And we're gonna be having our fall native plant sale as well. Um, that also has that September 7th order deadline. Uh, and that'll be for pickup on October 1st. So fall planting is my best and favorite time to plant anything at all because you have so little maintenance to do very little watering for a fall planting. So, and, and also typically you're finding plants for, uh, for discount rates as people are trying to dump their stock for the season. So um, if you, uh, after this class, if you dig and you know, in July, August, September, um, planting in September, October is a great idea. Uh, another resource available, we offer consultations. And one of the consultations uh, is a door prize for today. This is a way for you to get expert one-on-one -on -one guidance to achieve your goals. So if you need that extra support, um, it is available on a sliding scale at our website, therouge.org slash coach, or that RainSmart uh, link I originally gave you will also get you there. So those are a few of the resources. And again, every, every, everything that you could need, um, I'm attempting to get it on there. You'll find lists of professionals, lists of places where you can buy native plants, uh, all kinds of resources on there for you to take advantage of. And when we uh, launch our funding application for rain gardens, that's where it's going to be posted as well. You'll be able to find it there. All right, so that's BrainSmart, that overview of the resources. And uh, now I'm gonna move on to where. We are gonna step through uh, the wares of where uh, to put a rain garden. Uh, so a rain garden, it's a garden. So many of the factors that influence where any garden goes also influence rain gardens. So you need to have enough space for the garden. Uh, it needs to have at least a little bit of sunlight. The reality is that shade rain gardens uh, typically work better than dry shade gardens. There's a lot more plants that like wet shade than dry shade. So you don't need a lot of sunlight actually. You need at least a little bit. Uh, in addition, compared to other gardens, you need a water source, right? You need to have that roof. You need to have that driveway. You need to have that parking lot, that road, that sidewalk, or it's not a rain garden. And you need to keep in mind that water goes downhill. Um, we cannot pipe the water uphill to get to your garden space. So that's one of the biggest obstacles is, is your green space, is your open area, is it downhill from the hard surface? So those are the key elements that you need to be successful. I'm going to step you through some examples here now. So here is a home that, that had it all actually, had roof downspouts, had a sidewalk, had a driveway, um, and uh, they had a nice big green space right there to consider putting the rain garden into. So all the water traveled that direction into that space and uh, there you go. This is Carrie and Aaron's rain garden. After they got done building it, they took down their entire lawn. They had a lot of water. And so they wanted to do a nice big rain garden there, capturing the roof, the sidewalk, and the driveway. Here is another example. And this is um, probably the most typical example. It's this first space where there's, there's larger backyards, especially. Uh, there's a roof. There's a big open lawn space. Uh, in the backyard uh, and um, the water gets piped underground typically to get into that garden. And uh, what I recommend especially is it's the KISS principle. Uh, keep it simple. Superhero is my, uh, my take on that KISS principle. Um, I recommend starting as small as you possibly can. Why make it hard for the first one? Start small, even if it's not in your preferred location, small and easy. Um, do one rain garden, her downspout, try to avoid combining like three or four or five downspouts together to make a giant rain garden. Keep it small, keep it simple, do one. Next year, you can always do another downspout and another downspout. You can even expand that one you made to make just one bigger rain garden if you want. But starting small is the way to go. Uh, if you start too big, then you're gonna feel overwhelmed and you're gonna shut down. Starting small is gonna make it relatively easy. You will learn so much digging your first rain garden. Uh, what we have found is that after master rain gardeners finish their first rain garden, many of them go on to build garden number two, three, four, five to start helping their friends, uh, working with the school down the street and so on and so forth. And I'm sorry, if it does take over your life, my apologies in advance, but it is a lot of fun. So start small. This is a great example of that. Here's an example of a driveway rain garden. This is Anna Karen. She lives in Livonia. 
Um, and her driveway would ice up every winter time. Uh, there's a soil barrier adjacent to her driveway. And so she removed that soil bar barrier. You can see she added rocks to help filter some of um, the sediment, especially to keep it out of the rain garden. She's got a little depression there, soaking up that water and a beautiful plant palette. There is the garden a uh, year or two down the road with our beautiful native Michigan flamingo in the front. Um, there's some Joe pie weed towering in the back, some echinacea and some blue lobelia in the front. So blue and pink and purple palette. Beautiful garden that Anna built. So when you're thinking about site selection, the reality is and you will see this driving around uh, after this talk, is there are so many places to put a rain garden, it's almost better to think about where not to put a rain garden. So through the Master Rain Gardener training program, we have what's called the Hippocratic Oath of the Master Rain Gardener. First, do no harm. We wanna make sure there's enough space for the garden, the slopes are correct, we're avoiding obstacles, and we're avoiding hazards, underground hazards, and that we're planning for an emergency overflow. Those are some of our keys when we are working on a rain garden. So this is gonna be our quiz section here. So uh, here's our first example. What do you think? Is there enough space for a rain garden here? Please feel free to type it in the chat. And as I'm looking in the chat, I see people are correcting me. The Master Rain Gardener class, the next one is gonna be February, 2023. Yes, not February, 2022. I see a lot of folks saying no. I see a couple of yeses too. Uh, so the reality here is that this is probably too tight. We wanna keep, the rain garden about 10 foot away from a basement, especially from most buildings. So this is a little tight. We also have some utilities here, that gas line right there. So that's probably not the best place, but if that's what you've got, there are ways to work around it. So here's a great example of somebody that had a very narrow space and she piped it to where there was more space. So piping it along that narrow area out to her front yard where she had plenty of open space to build her rain garden. So if you have that tight space situation, never fear, don't give up yet. There might be a way to make it work. Uh, sometimes it's also possible to adjust the downspouts in ways that can get the water to a place that's more favorable. And I've seen people that have had really long runs of downspouts running along the side of their home to redirect the water as well. There are lots of ways to move the water. And especially when it's coming off your roof, you've got the, the fortune of a lot of height. Uh, most everything is downhill from your roof. So there are often ways to get that water moved to where it needs to be. All right, how about this one right here? Is this a good spot for rain? <sighs> Gave the answer. <sighs> is this a good space? The answer is no. Uh, there are tree roots here. So the reality is we do not want to build a rain garden typically within the drip canopy. So let's look up at your tree, follow it out to the tippy tip of branches and leaves, and then draw an imaginary line to the ground. That's the drip canopy. We typically do not want to build a rain garden within that space. It varies from tree to tree. Some trees can take it, some trees cannot. So if you've got a hard situation, we can look at the tree species and see whether it's okay, but there's a risk digging underneath that drip canopy that you might sever important roots for that tree and damage that tree. And you don't wanna do that. We do not wanna be killing trees to build rain gardens. We wanna be building beautiful rain gardens. They're solving problems, not creating problems. So uh, you could potentially look at piping that water farther away past the tree. That might be your best option there. Our next thing to avoid uh, are the underground utilities. It is amazing the things that are underground that we just don't even know we're there. So Miss Dig is your friend. And um, when you're doing that soil infiltration test, I, met, I mentioned at the start digging 18 inches deep, that is a good time to call Miss Dig. Uh, for that kind of dig, you are technically supposed to call Miss Dig. And conveniently, they will come out and they will mark these utilities and you'll be able to see um, what your obstacles might be. Electric, especially we want to avoid. Water lines are typically deep enough, about six feet deep. They're not typically an issue. Gas is questionable. Uh, it's good to avoid digging anywhere near any of these utilities. There have been some situations in which with very careful, very careful work, we've been able to, to plant near gas lines. But um, generally, there's an enormous risk working near any of these utilities. And if you could possibly avoid them, do so. All right, quiz time for you all. We've got about 20 minutes left in our presentation here. Left side, right side, what is the best place to build a rain garden here? Feel free to type it in the chat. If you can, maybe also add in why. And while you're typing, I see Maya asked the question, can you do it closer next to a slab? Potentially, um, even next to a slab, freeze thaw can still cause um, shifting that can damage the slab. 
especially if it's sandy soil, I'm more comfortable digging near a slab. But if it's clay soil, it's probably good to keep it 10 feet away from that slab. All right, I've seen people say right side, there isn't a tree, there's more space, right has a slope and a downspout, right side fewer tree roots, downslope. All right, do I, is there any love out there for left side? It looks like everyone's saying right. Ah, there we go. Jenny said left side. All right, we've got one call for left side. Come on, left. Let's hear it from the left folks who wants to say left side. Left, way left. Ah, the FIFA is on to something there with left, way left. So the reality on here, there's a couple of things that people have pointed out. I'll mention them. There's a tree on the left side, right? That That is a big obstacle. We do not want to dig near that tree. It looks to me to be a silver maple from this photo. Silver maples are actually way tolerant of root severance. It's impossible to kill a silver maple. You can convince it to drop a limb on your roof if you <laughs> if you want. Uh, so we do want to keep a good distance away from silver maples too. On the right side, there is a sidewalk in front of that downspout. There's a decent slope here. Those are things that are going to make it a little bit more difficult, not impossible, but a little more difficult on the right side. I do love how front and center it is. Wide open lawn there. That would be a fun place to have a rain garden. Well, the answer is, both, but the person uh, shown here did it on the left side and they did it, uh, as Afifa said, far away from that tree, far enough away that there were no roots to be concerned about. And uh, this garden has got some beautiful plants coming in. There's some um, marsh blazing star with its pink spikes coming in. Looks like we've got some um, um, black eyed Susans. There's what I'm stretching for in my head, some black eyed Susans blooming as well. So some beautiful, beautiful blooms coming into that garden space. All right, so we've done the where. Now we're going to get through the how, the sizing, the digging, the planting. I'm about five minutes behind schedule right now because of that little issue at the start of the presentation. I'm going to go through this. Um, I'll probably still have a good 10 minutes, maybe five minutes for questions. And I will stick around after one o'clock as well. If anyone has questions after one o'clock, I will stay until the questions are answered. So if I've not gotten to yours yet, I will get to it. All right, so how, actually, I'm gonna look at the QA and A and see if there are any questions about the where's that are relevant. Uh, I see somebody, I see Leah's asking, is it advisable to build a rain garden in a culvert basin next to the road? This is in an area where there's no water sewer, only septic wells. So the intention would be cleaning auto pollution as it enters the groundwater. So. So roadside, um, if I'm understanding that correctly, roadside rain gardens are really important. Actually, roads are the worst source of water and pollution. They are also our most difficult to build. And so for residents, we typically do not recommend trying to capture that road run, uh, runoff just because it's so polluted. There are things that we do to make the rain gardens work better, um, things called sediment traps, especially. Um, and sometimes there are even grease filters and such that will help to manage that pollution. But that said, uh, rain gardens next to roads are really important. And it's something that cities are increasingly doing, uh, especially as they're repairing roads. We hope to see that as roads are reconstructed, rain gardens are built next to them. Uh, the city of Ar Ann Arbor actually has a green streets policy that requires rain gardens to be uh, put along roadsides, uh, large enough roadsides as they're being reconstructed. So it's a great example for folks um, around Southeast Michigan. So roadside is great, but typically I don't recommend residents um, be the ones that design or build those. Um, Mary asked, will a tiny rain garden stop mold growing at a downspout on bricks? Um, so oftentimes that mold or that algae, it's from the moistness in the area. If you are getting that downspout into the pipe, getting the moisture moved away from that area, it might be enough, but oftentimes, especially on the north side of a home, it's just a moist area. Michigan has a moist climate. You might see, still see um, uh, algaes or uh, mosses growing on the side of your roof. Um, regardless of the, the roof downspout, oftentimes it is just wet enough uh, for that stuff still to be there. All right, and then Jeffrey is asking how much slope is too much. Um, I actually skimmed past a slide um, that kind of talks about that a little bit in the interest of time. So the reality is um, the steeper it is, the harder it is to work with. The more likely you're going to need to do terracing, basically, to manage the water. Um, and so I'm trying to remember, there's a rule of thumb on how much slope is too much. Um, I think it's 10% maybe. If you start get to get into to steeper than a 10% slope, it's going to just get much more expensive with rock work and such to manage. But it's not impossible. Um, I mean, people have been doing terracing on mountainsides uh, across the world for millennia. 
And so there are ways to do it, but it is much cheaper and easier to do it on a flat area rather than a steep area. All right, I'm gonna move on now. So uh, sizing, sizing, digging, all that kind of stuff. How big should the rain garden be? So you've, you've got your idea in mind for where maybe your rain garden should go. Now we wanna get a sense for how big it should be. And what I want you to take away with from today is the 20% rule and the notion that six inches is probably your right depth. Um, although there will be a caveat on that coming up in just a bit, depending on your soils. So 20%, great, 20%, 20% of what though, of the hard area draining to the garden. So you're ideally gonna pick that one downspout I mentioned earlier, um, not more than one, if you can avoid it, make it easy on yourself. And you're gonna measure the roof area that drains to that downspout. You're gonna make your best guess. And if you look, oftentimes you can see the elevation in the gutter itself. You can see where it's rising up and then it comes back down. You can kind of figure out where the gutter slopes are going. You're gonna measure that roof and that measurement is gonna be what you take the 20% of. So here's an example from an aerial. So the salmon colored there, that's the roof that's draining to that downspout. And then 20%, you can see, divide it by five, that's about the size that the rain garden should be. 20% of the drainage area going into that garden and about six inches in depth. And so the thing about this rule is it's interesting. That means you can have really teeny tiny rain gardens. You can have really big rain gardens. So this is Mallory Wilczewski's rain garden in the Ann Arbor area. She's in a little condo. She's got this teeny, teeny, tiny little patio area and she had a teeny, teeny, tiny little planting area, but it was perfect, it was 20%. Uh, so she was able to make a rain garden right in that area that managed that small area. And, and this is great. If you've got something like this, start as small as you can. Really, it's so much easier and you learn a lot and it makes the bigger ones that much easier to handle. So there's no such thing as a rain garden that's too small. The smallest one I've seen was about one or two square foot. I am serious. All right, now the complication is depending on your soils, it might change, right? So um, the 20% rule is really for average soils, especially. Um, and uh, your infiltration test, if you do it, that's going to give you some good advice about um, whether you need to go bigger. Basically, if you've got clay soils, if it drains slowly enough, then you're going to want to make the garden bigger, about 30%, and shallower, about three inches depth. And so it ends up being about the same amount of digging, actually. It's bigger though, there's a bigger footprint for it. So it's gonna be a little more planting. Um, and this works, this does wonders on clay soil. It will drain within 48 hours, no problem. And it's gonna soak up that water, no matter how bad your clay is, it's gonna work. Uh, and then if you're on the other extreme, if your soil is beach sand, and uh, we'll try not to get uh, jealous of you if that's what you've got, you can potentially make it smaller and deeper and have the garden work well. So if you've got a tight space, just make it a little bit deeper. You can make it maybe as small as 10%. But if you do a 20% sized on sandy soil, uh, that's not a problem. If you wanna make it bigger, it just means it's gonna soak up more water, bigger storms, but it's gonna be a dry garden. You need to pick plants that can handle drought. All right, quick overview on how to dig. So this is the, the 101 on digging, and this is showing a nice steep slope actually, getting back to that slope. The easiest way to do it, to save your back, to reduce the overall amount of digging, is it's uh, called balancing the cut and fill. We basically dig down on the upslope, and we pile soil on the downslope right there and create our berm area. And we wanna keep ourselves honest. This is showing how to use a string level with a line level attached to it to measure. We want this to be a flat space, as flat as possible across the whole rain garden, like maybe like a quarter inch variation, something like that. But flatness is how rain gardens work. It spreads the water out so that the water can sink into the ground. And then here's an example of showing that three to six inch. So three inches, if you've got clay, uh, heavy clay, especially, uh, and then six inches if you've got more like average soils. And then there's the pipe coming in. You can see ideally the rain garden is a little deeper than that pipe. That helps make the garden work to its best. And then we'll typically notch the overflow. So we define where the water is gonna overflow out of the garden space. Here's a beautiful example, um, Brenda Dietrich, um, one of my master rain gardeners showing off the textbook example of how to do a low effort uh, rain garden dig. The last major thing to be aware of when you're digging out your rain garden is um, the soils, uh, the soil profiles especially. So the reality is typically your good soil is at the very top. If you're not careful what people do wrong digging the rain garden is they just dig that good stuff off and they get rid of that and they plant in the bottom. If you do that, the reality is you're planting in low quality soil. 
If you've got clay, it might be 100% clay. It might be like a bathtub bottom that will never soak in. Really difficult for plants to survive in. If you've got sandy soil more, there's going to be no organic matter. Really hard for plants to survive. So your best practice is going to be to do this. I'm going to step you through it. So basically, dig to your plan bottom. And that's probably going to be the good stuff. Save that. Set it aside on a tarp or something. And then you're going to dig deeper. So maybe three to six inches deeper, um, what makes sense for you. That's going to be your subsoil. That's going to be what you um, use for your berm or you're going to discard. And then you're going to take that good stuff you set aside. You're going to put that back in the bottom so that at the end of it, your garden has good soil on, on the bottom for the plants to grow into. And uh, if the reality is that you have no good stuff and... Uh, some of us have no good stuff, it's true. Uh, instead of adding that soil back in, still dig out deeper, but add in maybe three inches of compost. And if you can rototill it in, that's great. Uh, that compost solves just about all drainage problems on heavy clay. It lightens it up so that the plants can survive and soaks it up better. And on sandy soil, it helps to hold the water back actually, so that the plants can survive a little bit better. So that's my 101 on how to dig it out successfully. Um, lastly, we're going to talk about rain garden plants, and then we'll have about five minutes, maybe three minutes for questions, but I will stick around a little longer. Apologies again about the issue at the start. So rain garden plants. Rain garden plants are a little different than other plants. They have to be able to absorb that three to six inches of ponded water. They are not a pond garden. It is not wet year round. It's actually going to be dry more often than it's wet. So it's also got to be able to deal with drought. That is the hallmark of a rain garden plant is a plant that handles wet and dry, both of those things. It's sometimes dry for a couple of weeks, hot and dry in the summertime. We want those plants to survive. So on our website, therouge.org slash plants, you will find rain garden plant lists. I'm not gonna go into them right now much, other than to say that if you don't identify as a gardener, there's the visual can't fail plant list. If you are someone that is comfortable with big long spreadsheets uh, of plants, there is that big long spreadsheet for you with all kinds of information. I'll step through it in a sec. There's a third list, common ornamental plants, non-native plants for rain gardens. These are not tested as well. We can't say for sure whether they're gonna work, but if you want to experiment and try some more traditional non-native plants, you can. We are big tent at Friends of the Rouge. Uh, the rain garden that makes you happy is the best rain garden. So looking, this is a snapshot of that plant list. I'm gonna give you um, an idea for how to go about picking plants successfully for a rain garden. So in that plant list, there's a moisture column um, and that is our key. It's got D for dry, M for medium, MS for moist and W for wet. Um, let's keep that in mind, D, M, S, M, I'm sorry, D, M, M, S and W. Now here is a profile of a rain garden uh, in the planting zones. So we've got three planting zones in a rain garden. We've got the upland area next to the rain garden. That's typically D to M, dry medium. We've got the slope, which is typically ranging from D, M to MS, dry, medium, moist. And then we've got the bottom area of the rain garden, which is typically medium, moist, to wet. And the variance there is soil dependent. If you've got sandy soil, it's going to be on the left side. It's probably going to be dry on the upper area. It might be dry on the slope as well. And then maybe at best medium on the bottom. If you have heavy clay, it's probably going to be more medium on the upland area, moist on the slope and wet on the bottom. Um, and then when you're thinking about picking plants, if you, there are some plants on here that have D, M, M, S, and W, those are plants that have a wide range of tolerance. Uh, they are resilient plants. I would recommend picking some plants that can handle just about anything. And then maybe a few plants that are a little more specific to what you guess your rain garden space is gonna be like. Uh, so that's my 101, how to go about picking plants successfully for a rain garden. Got some eye candy for you here. These are some plants that do really well in that wet zone on the bottom. Um, plants that you're maybe less familiar with is that that is a, a pretty unusual space, most people's yards. So you can see uh, some of our sedges, fox sedge, umbrella sedge, invincible plants that can handle anything you throw at them, wild iris, same thing, invincible plants, um, sensitive fern, beautiful native fern, swamp, milkweed for monarchs, prairie dock is one of my favorite plants in the universe, giant dinosaur leaves, huge flower stock, which you can snip off if you don't like it. The leaves are incredible. And then for shade, we've got plants like cardinal flower, blue lobelia, maidenhair fern. We've got astilbes, a non-native plant that works well in rain gardens in the shade. Culver's root, all kinds of beautiful plants that will look great in your yard. So here is Anne showing off her beautiful rain garden in Plymouth Township, thanking you all for being here again today. Thank you for joining Rain Gardens 101. Uh, again, the resources, if you want to access them, therouge.org slash rainsmart. 
Thank you again to the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation for making this event today possible. A river of gratitude to you all for being here. And last but not least, the door prize. Uh, if you'd like to get entered into the drawing for the door prize, go to therouge.org slash eval dash RG 101. I'll leave that up for a second. I'll try to type it into the chat. Go there. There's an evaluation for this course. After you complete the evaluation, you'll get the link to enter the door prize drawing. So thank you all. With that, I am going to enter into the q and I'm going to start working through those questions, and I am not going to leave until I've answered everyone's questions. So thank you all once more for being here today. Um, so let's see. Let's start working through them. There's a question about how to enter the raffle. You've just got the answer right there. Uh, it's from the Virginia Park community. And uh, Virginia Park also asked whether this is going to be recorded because I talk too fast. It's true. I always do. Uh, yes, this is being recorded and it will be shared back so you can access it later on. Um, June asked, what is the minimal size for a rain garden? And we answered that it's all relative to the size of the hard area. So about 20% is the typical or 30% for clay, maybe down to 10% uh, for sandy areas. And uh, there's no such thing as too small. If you are someone that has, uh, you know, maybe the 20% rule tells you you need a garden that is 200 square feet, but you only have a 150 square foot space. You don't have enough space for that rain garden. There is such a thing as the best you can do is good enough. It is possible also to do an undersized rain garden. If you just don't have enough space, an undersized rain garden might be better than what you already have. And if you are doing an undersized rain garden, there's just some things you have to be aware of uh, in terms of the problems that you'll experience and how to overcome them. And it's not, it's not hard to. It is many people have had undersized rain gardens successfully. So if you're in that situation, feel free to talk to me. Master Rain Gardener Group can also help with it. See, Sharon asked, I want to start with a few plants and add more later. Um, will it not work if it's mostly just dug out? So, okay, so basically you dig out your rain garden, but you don't plant it yet, or maybe you just plant a couple of plants um, and see how it goes. It probably will work actually, especially if it's on sandy soil. The gardens at our office at Park were mostly sandy soil and uh, they got dug out in October of a year. We didn't start planting until May of the next year. Those rain gardens soaked up an incredible amount of water without anything planted. So you can dig it this fall. November is about the latest I've seen anyone dig and then they've waited to plant until the following spring and that can work out. Clay can get a little bit trickier. The, the plants are gonna really help things out in a clay rain garden especially, but it is okay to just dig. It's okay to plant just a couple plants. Some people will do that as a cost saving strategy. You pick plants that are wildly aggressive. You know, there's the, the list of plants that say, don't plant this, it's wildly aggressive. It's gonna take over your garden. Some people say, ah, that's the plant for me. I'm gonna plant one, two, three and let it take over the space. So you can do that. You'll just wanna weed and keep the competition down and maybe take a, it might take a couple of years for those plants to really spread and take over, but that's a way you can potentially have a low cost rain garden. So I uh, hope that answers your question there, Sharon. Uh, Nancy, uh, Rochester Hills, clay and wet yard, water pools, front sidewalk, have two rain barrels not hooked up, need to take the downspout over the sidewalk and make a rain garden on the far side of the sidewalk to catch water from running into the street and move it off on the sidewalk. So I don't see a question in there, but I will make the comment that um, there are great examples of going over a sidewalk instead of going under a sidewalk out there. In the Master Rain Gardener class, we show lots of examples of ways to deal with tough sidewalk situations. Um, it sounds like Nancy's got a tough situation and she's doing some good things to try to solve it. Let's see, Ron Kruger, does edging prevent water from entering the rain garden? It could. Uh, it's going to depend on the context, especially if you're doing a buried pipe to bring the water into the rain garden, and then you've got a lawn edge that might block the pipe. Um, so it's going to be something you have to work around a little bit to figure out how to make that work. Um, I might consider uh, cutting the edging a little bit so that it allows the pipe to go underneath it uh, might be an option. You can potentially have the pipe outlet over the edging instead. Um, that doesn't always work out depending on slopes, but that might be a possibility. Um, you can also do a natural edge, although that would also have the pipe be somewhat exposed. So that's going to be something for you to work around. Worst case is maybe you've got one little spot where you don't have edging and that's just a slightly higher maintenance spot as well. Okay, and I've got the people correcting me on Master Rain Gardener, February 2023. Uh, Lisa asks if it's going to be available later. Yes, it will. 
Sarah, I have a downspout that is on my driveway, but the walkway to my house is between it and the yard. How can I direct it to a rain garden in my front yard? So hard to answer that in the abstract. Um, you can potentially pipe it under that little walkway um, to get to landscape on the other side. Uh, the long and short is get on the internet and search for tunneling under sidewalk and you will find 10, 20 YouTube videos showing people that have done it. There are lots of ways to do it. Some are easier, some are harder. It is not that difficult to go underneath the sidewalk. And the reality for many people is that they've got that problem. They've got water trapped in between a sidewalk and their home, and it's creating major problems. It is worth the effort to tunnel under that sidewalk. So I think you can, I think that might be the solution for you. Um, look into ways to tunnel under the sidewalk. Rebecca asks, do you recommend people to do piping? Uh, it's all about the context for the site as to whether piping is the best way to do it or if there's ways to send it overland through a swale. Um, but I will say it is not hard to do it. It is digging. If you physically are comfortable doing digging, then um, you can do it yourself. Um, oftentimes, piping to a pop of emitter is the most robust way to get the water away from your home foundation. So in most situations, I do recommend doing piping to get the water into the rain garden. Let's see, Pauline, I have a steep slope hill at the back of my yard. There are large pines, mostly shade. The water runs right down, taking dirt with it. I'm having a hard time getting ground cover and plants to grow. Is this a potential spot? There's a paved gully at the bottom of the hill. All right, so the trees are what make it maybe not the best spot for a rain garden. Also possibly the steep slope, right? A rain garden is gonna work best on a flat area or an area that we can make artificially flat. So on a steep hole like that, a uh, hill like that, it might take a lot of terracing, might be difficult to do with the trees there. There might be a lot of issues. So and this is maybe not relevant to most people, but um, on a hill slope, especially if it's just uh, water that's falling on the hill, if it's not water from like your roof that's running down that hill, you can often do a series of basically stacking uh, wood, uh, wood piles long perpendicular to the slope um, that will slow that water down from traveling down the hill. Basically start at the very top of the hill, wherever water might start eroding and start piling up brush piles, what have you, um, little like little logs like that big around, those kinds of brush piles to help slow that water down and work your way down the hill. By the time you get to the bottom, the water will have been slower the whole way that it won't have eroded away quite so badly. That might work for you. There's a lot of pictures on the internet about how to do that. Um, email me if you don't find them, I can help you uh, find one of them. Uh, but if it's like a roof area, if it's a roof area that is draining to the hill and then eroding down the hill, I would try to see if you can do a rain garden at the very top, um, as near to the house as possible. See if there's a flat area that you can soak the water up before it gets to the hill. All right, next question, we've got Barbara. My yard is very large and very wet. Tonquish Creek runs under our neighborhood. Our downspouts go in a different direction. The yard is very wet just from rain. How big a garden would be suggested? And so I'm gonna want you to do the calculations for your roof area, for the contributing area there. And that's probably gonna be your best bet. If there are really large lawn areas that drain to a space, there are ways to do calculations um, for rain gardens that are just getting fed by water running over lawn. Um, and if it's clay, my recommendation to you basically is to try to get on like Google Earth, try to measure the space, measure the lawn area that's draining there. And then probably about 40% of um, that area um, so if, say it's a thousand square feet area of lawn draining to a garden, and I might lose you all with the math here. I don't normally do this. Um, I'm gonna say maybe think about that thousand square feet of lawn as being 40% of the size. So maybe we think about it as a 400 square foot hard surface area, and then we size the rain garden appropriately. That That is a rule of thumb I just made up off the top of my head, um, but for heavy clay lawns, I think that that might be reasonable to do. So as an example then, heavy clay, thousand square foot lawn, uh, creating water problems, not worrying about a roof right now, just the lawn. I'm going to say maybe 40% of that, so 400 square feet, and then we're going to do the 30% rule for clay on that 400 square feet. And so that's going to come out to about 120 square foot rain garden. So I probably lost you all in the math on that. My apologies for that. Quick answer for how to think about sizing um, if you're just dealing with runoff from a lawn rather than from a hard surface. 
Kevin Green, there are more questions in the chat. I will get to the chat <laughs> after I get through the Q&A. Uh, Diane, so if you put it in the chat, feel free to put it in the Q&A uh, to get into the queue. Diane says, are rain gardens planted along Heinz Drive since it floods so often? So Heinz Drive, for those of you that haven't been along Heinz Drive, that's the middle branch of the Rouge. It floods all the time. And aren't we grateful that it floods because it's keeping water uh, there, flooding park areas where there's not a problem. It's keeping water out of people's basements in Detroit. So we're very grateful for Heinz Drive and its flooding. The reality is that's not technically a rain garden. This is the thing that's actually, it's a, a hard thing for a lot of people to get their head wrapped around. We do not want to put a rain garden where it's flooding. We want to instead see where it's flooding and then trace all that water back upstream to its source. And we want lots of little rain gardens all in those source areas. So up out of the flood area is the place for a rain garden. So, you know, it's uh, Heinz Drive is getting flooded by a lot of Livonia, um, I believe by some Salem Township, by some Northville, by some maybe West Bloomfield. It's all in those areas where if we're doing more rain gardens, we're keeping the water high upstream, we're keeping it out of Heinz Drive a little bit more. But Heinz Drive is a floodway. Heinz Drive will always flood. It will always flood. And that's great. That's what it's there for. All right, next question. Can you build a rain garden to catch the drainage off of an elevated brick patio? Yeah, brick patio is a hard surface. Uh, it is going to have stormwater runoff um, that's going to be causing problems downstream from it. And so it is a perfectly reasonable source of water for a rain garden. It's going to be just all the same questions we had. Is there green space downstream from that elevated brick patio that you can tap into to convert into a rain garden to soak that up? Virginia says, I don't have gutters. I want to use a rain barrel and collect water and then take a hose to the rain garden. Is that something I can do? Um, rain barrels work best with gutters that are concentrating the water into that rain barrel space. Rain barrels, though, typically cannot have handle that much water. There are some people that have gotten these like giant funnel things. You can find it on the internet, a giant funnel that uh, goes into your rain barrel. And so it's possible you can just have that giant funnel on top of the rain barrel and it might be enough to fill up and then water the plants in your rain garden, it's possible that that could work out for you. Um, for my rain gardens, I planted in my yard. I watered them all with water from my rain barrels. I have five rain barrels at my home. I've got three along my back downspout um, that fill up after just about every storm. And I use that water to water, uh, water my rain gardens when I planted them. And I water some of the plants in my vegetable gardens, the plants for which it saves the water. All right. Justine, I have a grassy easement with a sewer in the middle. Is that obstacle a no-go? So it's an easement, right, which means you don't own it. It's owned by your municipality. And so the first thing is you need to get permission to work in that space. Uh, many municipalities are very excited about rain gardens and will be happy to let you do it. They might provide you some guidance for what is and is not acceptable in that space. Some municipalities are not on board with it, so it's going to really depend. And if there's a sewer in the middle, if it's like a drain, especially in the middle, that can be a really easy place to put a rain garden because that drain is your overflow. So it's a very common style of rain garden where I find an existing drain and around that drain, I maybe lower the soil elevation by like three to six inches. And so that way it fills up with water. And then when it's over full, it goes right into the drain and continues on its way. So oftentimes working with existing community drains can be a great way to go with rain gardens, but you need to get permission to work in an easement. And uh, easement is also called a right of way. Typically the space between your sidewalk and the street is easement is right of way owned by a city for which you need to get permission. All right, uh, Lars asked if you can have a rain barrel and a rain garden. We've already pretty much discussed that. They go great together. I love to have my rain barrel overflow into my rain garden. So the rain barrel fills up and then when it overflows, because they always do, it goes right into our rain garden and we're maximizing our use of water. Maya, oh gosh, Ryskowski. Uh, if you have an immature tree, could you place a rain garden under its estimated mature drip canopy size? Yes, absolutely. Do not worry about how big it's gonna get, worry about how big it is now. So say you planted a little tree, it's got a little drip canopy, work with that little drip canopy. You can plant the rain garden near the tree, the tree's roots as it matures over 20, 50, 100 years, it will send its roots where they wanna go. It might go under the rain garden, it might avoid the rain garden if it's a tree that does not like a lot of water, uh, but it will probably, it should work just fine there. Uh, and oftentimes, I've done that, A, uh, and oftentimes I'm planting new trees next to rain gardens and sometimes planting trees on the bottoms of rain gardens as well. So trees are a great pairing 
with rain gardens, highly recommended, and there's no problem with building a rain garden near a small tree. Sonia is asking to give the link to the door prize again. And uh, let's see if I can do that in the chat right now. I did mean to do that earlier, Org slash eval dash rg 101 let's see i just typing it into the chat there and uh if somebody if i typed that wrong please correct me i'll type it in again um gail asks water comes from sump pump fed every five minutes lots of iron exit feeds creek going to retention pond is iron sediment prohibitive to make a rain garden you have stumped the chump gail i have no idea uh, how iron sediment may or may not impact a rain garden so congratulations um you have successfully stumped the chump and that's actually we've been thinking about doing a stump the chump master rain gardener show sometime to bring back people that have had challenging situations to see uh whether or not we have been able to solve those problems. I will do some research on iron sediment uh, after this and see what I see um, in terms of its potential impact for a rain garden. I have no idea. I thought that question was going to be about sump pump gardens at first, which is a thing. Many people have sump pumps. They've got sump pumps that are flooding their lawn and they come asking whether or not a rain garden can solve that problem. And the answer is typically yes, but it is tricky to size a rain garden for a sump pump. Um, that's a little bit more challenging to figure out how much water is coming out of that sump pump into the rain garden space, but it is not impossible. Um, but it is certainly beyond the scope of this class. Um, that's a good one for a consultation. Katie asks, is an easement between the sidewalk and the road an acceptable location? So I have shown actually, I think I showed pictures of a few gardens in those spaces. There are many examples of residents who have built rain gardens in those easement spaces. The Hell Strip is my favorite name for it. That is space though that is municipally owned. So you do need to get permission before you build in those areas. And uh, with permission, it is a perfectly acceptable space. The biggest concern most municipalities are gonna have, I will mention it now, is visibility. Uh, as drivers are driving through your neighborhood, they're going to want to be able to see people, see widely. And if you plant really thick vegetation right along the side of the road, that makes it difficult for visibility, it makes it unsafe. As you're backing out of your driveway, people aren't going to be able to see you and you're going to get hit. So if you're doing an easement garden after you've gotten permission, they will probably tell you. But if they don't, I'm telling you now, plant little plants. Uh, try to keep your height like under 18 inches. The good thing about a rain garden is we're starting six inches below grade. And so, you know, an 18 inch plant is only gonna come up actually like a foot or so. So you could maybe even go to a two foot plant, um, but try to keep it under 18 inch maximum height. All right, that's all the questions that were in the q and I'm gonna look back at the chat now and uh, see if there's any questions in there I missed. I still have the Q&A open, so feel free to toss in there if you would like. But uh, I will say as I am looking, thank you all once more for joining us for Rain Gardens 101. I look forward to reviewing your evaluations. I learn something every time we offer this class. Um, the door prize drawing will be in two weeks from today. So if you're watching this online, yes, you can still enter. And, um, and, uh, uh, and I will look forward to getting the applications for the Rain Garden funding out. I'm expecting within about two weeks or so. So exciting things to look forward to. I'm so excited to see what you do with this information highly recommend take the next month or two to plan design your garden august september is a beautiful time to to dig your garden out planting it in september october and uh, if you have to wait till next spring to plant it that's great as well so uh, let's see i'm looking for questions i see cindy is asking in the q a are daylily plants on plymouth road and plymouth rain gardens. I do not know where you're talking about. <laughs> um, the daylilies can work in rain gardens. Uh, they're ones that we don't typically recommend uh, because they're non-native plants. So they're not going to get that habitat value. There's a particular variety of daylily that is invasive. Uh, but that said, you know, again, we are big tent. If daylilies make you happy, please do. And there actually have been times I've thought about planting them myself because so many people recognize and appreciate daylilies. So if we're trying to plant a rain garden in a space where people are not really accustomed to or familiar with rain gardens, choosing plants like daylily can be a great choice to, 
help people to recognize the garden as something valuable and something that they will appreciate. So there's a good strategic use for planting plants like daylily. But uh, I cannot say whether or not that particular area is a rain garden. Uh, and Cindy's got a follow up the easement on Plymouth and Sheldon. And man, I just don't know my Plymouth geography well enough to crack that out at the top of my head. Um, I don't, I can't think of a rain garden in that space. There's a lot of drainage ditches. That would be my guess as to what that is. Um, Plymouth Township especially has a lot of drainage ditches that are designed to convey water through the system eventually into the river. So moving it out of the built environment to the river space. And some people have made easement, uh, I'm sorry, ditch gardens into quasi rain gardens. Um, and that is something you can potentially do as well, but typically the better spot is upstream from the ditch. So that, that's not a direct answer to your question because I just don't know the space very well. Uh, continuing to work through the chat to see if there's any other questions on there. Mary Lane pointed out that Henry Ford College has some nice parking lot rain gardens. There's a bunch of beautiful rain garden demonstrations out there. Sorry for the silence, folks, looking to see where's the recording of the stored. I need to bail and I need to see the how part. I will share it with Rebecca um, on our Facebook page and I will share it also on our YouTube channel. And I will try to get the link out um, in the follow-ups that come from this presentation. So you should be able to get access to it. All right, it looks like I'm seeing a lot of questions that were in the chat that got moved to the Q&A. So I'm skipping past those. Deanna says, thank you. This was lovely. Great advice to start small. It's like you already know me that I would get overwhelmed. You are very welcome, Deanna. I have supported hundreds of rain gardeners uh, before you and uh, starting small is the best way. Lots of thanks in here. You're welcome, everyone. Very glad to have you. Um, my question I've already answered. Uh, Swathi is asking if there are any public rain gardens we can visit for inspiration. My best uh, reference for you just generally would be the rain gardens at the Plymouth Arts and Recreation Complex, which are still one year old, so they're still maturing, but that's going to be a fantastic demonstration. Otherwise, Swathi, uh, within, gosh, like the goal is to launch this thing in like a month or two, you will be able to see on a map all the public rain gardens in Southeast Michigan so that you can find one near to you or many near to you to explore. So we are working on that. Um, that should be available for you in not, uh, the not too distant future. Let's see. All right, I'm not seeing any more questions. I think, oh, I see Pamela, if the sump pump bubbles into your front yard, can that be a good spot for a rain garden? I sort of address that, that it's tricky. Um, really a consultation would be the, the helpful thing as well. All right, I'm gonna wrap it up. We are 20 minutes over time. Um, I think we got through all the questions except for Kevin's, what about behind a garage? Um, near a garage can be great. Um, you probably wanna be um, 10 foot away from the slab, maybe five foot away from the slab if you have to, um, especially if it's sandy. But uh, as long as you've um, avoided you know, killing trees, you've got the space you need, um, there's not utilities there, behind a garage can be a great place. All right, wrapping it up, shutting down. Thank you all one more time. Have a wonderful day and happy rain gardening.